Good afternoon. We can do better than that. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome. Let me, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the entire Brookings family, welcome you. I'm Art Collins, a member of our Board of Trustees, and we are excited about today's program. There are many additional participants who are on our webcast. We welcome you for being with us today. Um, but in particular, we want to thank each of you who came out and weathered today's rain and joined us. We're going to have an exciting discussion and look forward to your participation. As you know, we're gathered today to discuss the import importance of social mobility, uh, the idea that regardless of where you're from, where you live, you should have access to employment, education, housing, and the vital services which provide the quality of life that you should expect for you and your family. These issues are, are personally important to me, having grown up in the inner city of Chicago. These issues are issues that many residents face every day, and they're not a given. It is not given a given that you will have quality education. It is not given that you will have access to quality housing, affordable housing. And so for these reasons, our subject matter is an important discussion. Under the leadership of Amy Liu, uh, the head of our Metropolitan Policy Program at Brookings, we're laser focused on social mobility and other issues, issues that revolve around assisting cities and metropolitan areas as they build their economies and work for all segments of the population where every member of that community benefits. So let's kind of move on to what we're here for today. Uh, we're pleased to be joined by two of the president's cabinet members, Housing and Urban Development Secretary Julian Castro and my good friend Secretary Anthony Fox. Thank you for being with us today. Both of our cabinet secretaries have been through the highest calling in life. They were big city mayors. <laughs> the toughest job in America in elected office. I, I remember the days uh, of, of uh, living in Chicago and I saw mayors come and go and some went without their own design because they didn't pick up the trash on time or they didn't remove the snow on time. And so those are really tough jobs where you're at the front line with the, the electorate and citizens. They, of course, are from San Antonio and Charlotte, respectively, and both are perfectly positioned and appreciative of the on-ground implications of the federal policy that they're administering within their respective agencies. Today, we'll be hearing from each of them as they implement President Obama's opportunity agenda, agenda and what that looks like through the eyes of housing and transportation. After the panel with the cabinet members, we will have a response pa panel of leaders from Baltimore, Chicago, and Kansas City. And we'll talk about what's being done in their respective re regions, what's working and what's not working, and the challenges that they face and the opportunities that they are presented with. And with this backdrop, we will move forward, and I'll bring to the stage Amy Liu, as well as Secretaries Castro and Fox. Welcome them as they come. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Art. Um, I can barely see him. There he is. But it's been a real pleasure getting to know and work with Art over the last few months. Um, welcome, everyone, this afternoon. I'm very excited and honored to um, facilitate this conversation between Secretary Castro and Secretary Fox. Um, you know, the last time Brookings had two secretaries on the stage at the same time was five years ago when um, Secretary LaHood and Secretary Donovan uh, had a conversation facilitated by my predecessor, Bruce Katz. So it's clear we at Brookings love the partnership between HUD and DOT. Um, 
But today's topic, pa topic, Pathways to Opportunity, is a very important and timely one. Um, yes, the U U.S. economy has grown. We have seen 71 consecutive months of job growth, but many people and households are not better off. And this is particularly true if you are poor and cut off from jobs, from good schools, and opportunity. So let me bring this to sharp relief in two metropolitan areas that these two mayors, or mayors, former mayors, know well, which is Charlotte and San Antonio. Both Charlotte and uh, the San Antonio metropolitan areas have experienced remarkable job growth since 2000s and since the recession. And these two regions have seen enormous growth in poverty. Charlotte, in particular, has seen its number of poor residents more than double since 2000, both in the city and the suburbs. Meanwhile, we know that living in neighborhoods of high poverty, concentrated poverty, is the most socially and economically isolating. Well, the number of high poverty neighborhoods and the share of poor residents living in them have grown in both the San Antonio and Charlotte metropolitan areas. So in short, while the nation and those two metropolitan areas have experienced economic expansion, it has come with economic exclusion. So today, we have an opportunity to have a conversation with two distinguished leaders who have the perspective of being in the community, leading cities through change, but also now trying to do it from the platform of the federal um, uh, apparatus. We're going to talk about the role of federal policy in trying to re break down these former barriers to opportunity so we can increase opportunity for more Americans. So I'm going to start with Secretary Castro. So at the heart of this is the importance of housing choice. And so last summer, HUD announced a new rule to further affirmatively for fair housing. I'm sure we get that stumbling all the time. Oh, I know. I do. I do. <laughs> and that is consistent with the Civil Rights Act and the House Fair Housing Act back in 1968. And it actually followed a Supreme Court ruling on disparate impact um, last summer. So can you explain for all the transportation buffs that are here primarily to see Secretary Fox, <laughs> What that rule means, what does it actually mean in practice to see for fair housing advanced, and what is new about the rule? Yeah, uh, and first of all, thank you so much, Amy, and everybody here at Brookings Art. Thank you and, and the board uh, and my great colleague, uh, uh, Secretary Fox. Uh, it's really a treat to be here and to get to, to talk about uh, issues that really press at the heart uh, of the work that we love to do. and. Um, put at the center the people that we love to serve. Um, and it was fascinating to hear San Antonio and, and, uh, and Charlotte and what's happened there. Um, and I think, you know, you can write that story, as you say, in city after city, community after community. So uh, as the folks in this room, many of the folks know, um, the administration has been very focused on how we can create opportunity throughout the nation and in every part of communities in the United States. And the president has said very often that uh, that a child's zip code should not determine where he or she goes in life, shouldn't determine destiny. Uh, at the same time, uh, in uh, St. Louis, for instance, uh, we find that uh, somebody growing up in the Clayton neighborhood, the upscale Clayton neighborhood, can expect to live 18 years longer than somebody gr growing up in the Jeff Vanderloo neighborhood, uh, not too far away in that metro. Uh, and, you know, this analysis that I've often cited is the Washington Post did an analysis and found that uh, there were 14 uh, neighborhoods in the Baltimore area that had a lower life expectancy than North Korea, including the neighborhood where Freddie Gray grew up. Uh, and so it's clear, and I think all of us know it, that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to making investments to ensure that that we have high opportunity areas everywhere. And if you think about it, kind of there are two ways that HUD does that. One way has been with our traditional resources of investing in neighborhoods 
whether it's through CDBG or home or place-based work, more recently like choice neighborhoods, promise zones, and other things. The other way is by creating mobility. Uh, and this is best expressed in our housing choice voucher program, ensuring that folks can go into the private market and, and live where they want to live. Um, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule is a piece of unfinished business from the 1968 Fair Housing Act that basically said that the Secretary of HUD uh, has an obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. And to me, what that means, the way that I think about it, is that, um, that you can't stack and you can't segregate, basically. If you think about what a lot of cities have done, uh, and to connect this just in the visual to transportation, right, we always think about people that lived on the other side of the tracks, for instance. That every city, including my city of San Antonio, literally had folks that were concentrated into areas. The, the story of the last 20 years is that we've been working in different ways to deconcentrate poverty. So I think of it as that you can't stack folks and you can't segregate folks. Uh, and AFFH basically says, we're going to give you a new set of tools um, to do an assessment of fair housing in your community that, that gives you data uh, about where, uh, where uh, concentrated poverty is, where the community assets are, uh, what the segregation index looks like in your community, so that you can make, if you're a, a local policymaker, smarter decisions about how investments should be made and what policies should be, in, be put in place so that you don't have concentrated poverty and that you increase the ability of folks to, to be mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us saw the research last year by Raj Shetty and the group of folks out of Harvard about the impact, the personal impact that, that mobility into higher opportunity areas can make. What AFFH does is that it really gives communities the tools that they need, I think, to make smarter decisions. Um, when you combine that with work that we've been trying to do, for instance, with state housing finance agencies in their QAPs so that they use LIHTC in a smarter way, uh, and then the work that, that Gustavo Velasquez and our fair housing folks do every day to try and, from the federal level, ensure that there's a fair housing landscape out there, all of that adds up to, we believe, an unprecedented opportunity, because you asked uh, at the end of your question, what's new about this? Really, it's an unprecedented opportunity to both make smarter decisions, and then there is, I think, also more of a stick to this as well. There's more of a carrot and more of a stick. It's for those communities that absolutely refuse to desegregate uh, to, uh, in the face of, of uh, housing opportunities that are not fair to do anything about it, then it says, look, you know, you can't just keep taking federal money uh, and get away with that. And uh, gone are the days where we're, we're going to look the other way. Um, this is also a commitment to more robust enforcement after we have worked with these communities to do better. But that's a very important caveat. We want to first work collaboratively with communities and let local leaders lead the way but when that fails, because there's just uh, intractability there, uh, and we hope that doesn't happen, but sometimes it does. Uh, you know, we've had these spectacular examples, like you know, in places in New York and other parts. Um, then we are going to enforce it, and we are going to hold folks accountable. Yeah. Secretary Fox, that's, there's clearly a role for transportation in this. Um, Secretary Castro already sort of suggested this. But I think in the history of cities, we hear more about the role of insurance redlining, of the construction of public, you know, high-rise public housing in perpetuating se segregation. But transportation policy has not been off the hook here. So you've been very passionate about uh, the importance of making sure that federal transportation policy begins to address some of those legacy practices. Tell me, what, what have you been doing, um, either new or proposed, you know, current policies or proposed policies, to really um, begin to unravel those historic barriers to opportunity? Well, thank you, Amy. And I also want to thank you and Brookings for having us here today. And it's always a great pleasure for me to join the stage with my great colleague, Julian Castro at HUD. Um, this is an issue that concerns me 
um, because I think not only does transportation play a role, I think transportation has exacerbated some of these divisions in city after city across the country. Um, in my own hometown of Charlotte, you, which you mentioned, if you made a pie and you cut it into four segments, there's really only one segment of that city that has a substantial positive impact on property values. The rest of it has been more or less trailing. So you've got three quarters of the city where property values are basically flat or declining and one quarter where they've been increasing. That's emblematic of the type of um, structural um, problem that we had in, in the city of Charlotte. When I look back over the history of it though, what I see is that when the highway system was organized and developed back in the 1950s, uh, a lot of the designs actually ran through parts of the community that were high minority, high low income, and people were basically robbed of the one asset they had, uh, which was their home. And uh, in several of those early years, there was no reimbursement program for the losses they, that occurred. Uh, and so folks were literally left with the value of a home lost uh, due to eminent domain and the, the, the cities and the states could value it at the price uh, with a highway running through it, which was almost pennies on the dollar. So we have a very ugly history of our infrastructure system being built. And that's one of the reasons why we use transportation metaphors to describe where people live, other side of the tracks or what have you. And so I've taken it seriously to try to figure out how transportation can both uh, be used to get people places, but also how transportation can be more of a uh, level setter on placemaking. So for example, um, there are projects we're doing all across the country now where the point of it is mobility for sure, but also part of the point of it is growing more revitalization activity in historically underserved areas. For example, a light rail project in Crenshaw, Los Angeles, where, you know, who'd have thought 30 years ago we'd be putting light rail in Crenshaw? But it's actually coming in there through local hire. We're able to have people in the neighborhood working on the project in their backyard. And you're starting to see businesses get more attracted to that area. And so Neighborhood services are coming in like, uh, you know, laundry, laundry facilities and uh, pharmacies and grocery stores and these types of things where we've seen deserts in the past. So I think the future for transportation in this area of opportunity is uh, both at the local and state level, we've got to have enlightened mayors and governors and leaders at the local and regional levels who are thinking creatively about not only how transportation can increase mobility, but how transportation can bring down some of these barriers that we've, we've had historically. And I'll give you one more example. Uh, Rochester, New York, which got a Tiger V grant, uh, that was a community where the highway system literally did bifurcate the neighborhoods uh, running through the downtown area. And they asked us for a Tiger grant to actually tear down part of that highway to restore the connectivity. And we've been able to help them get that project moving. And so we're even seeing communities now beginning to rethink the design of the original system. And the federal government should play a role in helping them do that. Great. I want to now talk about implementation and how we give more states and localities the tools to really execute on the promise of both the things that you both, both talked about. So I'm going to start with Secretary Castro. And I know that given the rule, um, localities and states essentially have up to about five years begin to be in compliance starting from last year, correct? The, the whole the round of, of folks will start um, be, have to be in compliance, you know, starting in, in uh, later 2016, but there are basically, there are 22 communities this year and then some next year. And yeah. It'll run through about 2020 before all of them have had to comply. Yeah. I think about how daunting that is because uh, what you're talking about is not a lot of time to uh, change programs, um, restructure things that have been embedded in a lot of behaviors. It's about housing land use laws, you know how hard zoning ordinance changes are, changing the attitudes of developers and apartment owners. So 
what tools, either beyond the ones you've just mentioned, but even in the FY17 budget, are you giving to states and localities to make sure they really can um, meet those standards? It's a great question, um, uh, and, and I'll answer that specifically. Second, let me just say that really I think the key to this was that we started beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, you all may remember that uh, for folks who follow it, that AFFH actually came up in the 1990s. There was an attempt in 97 or 98 to, to get this across the finish line. It did not. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, uh, that happened starting a few years ago was that uh, the team, our team, went to uh, different cities uh, and localities and got their input on how they could uh, do this in a way that was feasible and implementable. Uh, so the, the rule itself and the tools that I mentioned I think are geared to be user friendly in a way that is going to help them be implemented. But on top of that, uh, number one, we're offering a whole bunch of technical assistance out there to communities to get this right. It helps that, that these are going in tranches so we don't have all of these entitlement jurisdictions that are due the same year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, secondly, uh, we're, as part of that, you know, we're increasing our staff uh, in the Fair Housing Office that is going to be able to, to reach out and help communities. Uh, and then on top of that, and I'll, I'm sure, talk a little bit more about this, but we're doing something that we're calling a prosperity playbook mm -hmm. that relates very well to AFFH. Uh, in five cities, we're going to be engaging in deep-level conversations with the elected officials policymakers, nonprofits, and community uh, about how all of these issues tie together, uh, including issues like transportation. Great. Um, so, Secretary Fox, I think what's one of the most interesting things out of the head start that you've been doing on preparing for the rule is that a lot of the MPOs and the Council of Governments have really stepped up um, and are now the word quarterbacking a number of these regional efforts, regional opportunity, regional mobility. So again, what kind of tools are you thinking that you can give to MPOs and um, many of their partners in trying to you know, advance regional opportunity mobility? Well, one of the best tools we can provide MPOs is uh, money. Um, <laughs> I think you true. just. I, <laughs> that's what they like the most. So, yeah. I think you get a lot of head nodding from across yeah. the webcast on that one. Um, and the president's fiscal year 2017 budget actually takes seriously an argument that we've been uh, making in the department for a while, which is that um, the MPOs that are succeeding at regional planning and getting projects done and, and really taking into account a holistic view towards uh, regional gro growth, uh, I think in many ways are doing it despite the way we treat those MPOs from a federal government perspective, not because of. And so we're trying to put resources in place through this budget to support the visions that come up from the ground up. And we also are working on some rules to strengthen the incentive for MPOs to work on a regional basis. The Brookings Institute has a long history of promoting the concept of mega regions and the, the fact that our economies are beginning to organize around those regions. And yet many of it, we have 400 and some MPOs around the country and we don't have that many mega regions. And the problem we have is that we've almost incentivized the local jurisdictions to create these locuses of control, even though they are much smaller than the area of economic influence. And so we're trying to craft um, rules that get us closer to having that decision making where the economic uh, influence is most, uh, most felt. It's a challenge, but we're going to continue working towards that, both money and structural changes to ensure the MPOs are working the way they were actually designed to work. Well, you've launched something called la Ladders of Opportunity, yeah. correct? How does that fit into all this? So ladders of opportunity is sort of, I would call it like a three-pronged strategy within the department. Uh, one of it, one of the uh, focuses of it is, is, is with the resources that we deploy. Um, with our Tiger Grant program, there's now actually a way that we measure the degree to which communities are, uh, are actually proposing projects that are going to create more access points for folks. Um, secondly, we're looking at our practices and programs to ensure that uh, even when we're not putting out discretionary grant money, as we're reviewing projects and using our administrative discretion, that we also have our eye on that. 
And the third piece of it is the Department of Transportation makes thousands of decisions every day. For example, uh, we, uh, we know that now increasingly, uh, in my view unfortunately, around the country, um, folks are having to show IDs to vote. Uh, well, what happens when a state shuts down a bunch of DMVs that we pay money to, to, uh, to invest in to hold up? Uh, we're actually starting to step up some of our Title VI enforcement power, and we're actually investigating Alabama uh, for closing down some DMV locations and limiting folks' access to driver's licenses. So we're looking very broadly at how opportunity is impacted, not only by the dollars that we spend, but by the design of projects that get built around this country and by the projects that get to the top of the list and those that are at the bottom, trying to make sure folks are thinking about income inequality and spreading opportunity more as they build infrastructure. Because as I said, the history is not very good. So I want to hear you both talk about the way the two agencies can work together, because I think you both talked about tools that each of you give. And as I mentioned, when Secretary LaHood and Secretary Donovan were here, I think in part was a spirit uh, created under the Sustainable yes. Communities Initiative, yes. where it was a formal interagency effort. Um, and I think that because of that um, collaboration, you're now seeing you know, hundreds of cities around the community that are now starting to think more deliberately about how to link housing, land use, and transportation in ways to think about in new criteria and new ways. How can that infrastructure that has been built in a number of cities, those partnerships and collaborations, how can that be tapped given this new emphasis and more urgent emphasis around opportunity access to good schools and good neighborhoods? Well, you're right. Uh, sustainable Communities was, I think, a groundbreaking effort and just a, a great example of silo busting. And it's something that, that I uh, certainly took note of when I was mayor of San Antonio. Um, and the good news is that uh, even though you know, that has sunsetted in terms of funds going out there, those communities that received planning grants did some fantastic work. And now, you know, the departments are, are making investments in, in working with those communities to make those plans come to life. Um, and so that work continues. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, we're working on uh, things like promise zones mm -hmm. that involve multiple departments, including HUD and transportation in different ways. Not in every city where we have promise zones, but when they have housing and transportation related issues. Um, we're, when we do uh, our choice neighborhoods, competition, uh, one of the things that we take into account are issues related to access to transit and education and so forth, and so there's a natural working relationship there. Uh, and this prosperity playbook mm -hmm. that I talked about. So this is basically an effort uh, that, at the end of the day, what we want um, in 2016 is a, is, is a work product um, based on these five cities. We just launched it in Kansas City in that region um, that says, what can communities do in terms of policies and place-based work to enhance mobility? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a couple of the cities that we're looking at, specifically I think the best example is Denver with its fast tracks mm -hmm. that runs across the region. Uh, one of the concerns is gonna be, well, how can you use the fact that you have this just fantastic investment of rail to build affordable housing opportunities around that in a more robust way? Uh, and one that also, uh, you know, is from a fair housing perspective, um, it gives housing opportunity to people of different income levels and so forth. So the work continues, uh, and the Department of Transportation and Secretary Fox have just been excellent uh, about uh, taking into account, I think, like, like I know um, the President would want all of us to do, and we do, uh, not just you know, housing issues or transportation issues, but how these things and other issues come together. I, I would I would wholeheartedly agree. I, I, maybe to put um, a finer point on something I said earlier, I think the old way of thinking about transportation in this space is um, we're going to take somebody out of the rough, uh, kind of rough and tumble neighborhood they live in and get them to a place where they can go to school or a job or something else. And we still need to do that. The question that we're asking together and working on together is how do you create transportation access that begins to punch above its weight in that neighborhood? How do you start to see that neighborhood changed in a positive way 
as a result of the investments we make. And we don't make really any of our discretionary decisions about grants like TIGER or whatever anymore without consulting with our colleagues at HUD and getting a sense of their sense of how our community is going to tackle those issues. So I'm going to um, ask a question that builds off your uh, comment about prosperity. Mm -hmm. Because this is about, again, taking these issues out of their silos. So I'm going to ask you to put your mayor's hat on. Mm -hmm. How does it feel? You miss it? Feels a lot more nonpartisan. <laughs> Suddenly I feel a lot calmer, you know? I feel like everybody's with me, not just half of the people. <laughs> but when I think of the work of mayors, you know, I think about... Um, and all the other jurisdictions and communities, the amount of stuff on their plate. You know, they have to balance a budget. They have a looming pension crisis. They are trying to figure out how to um, do community policing now and create safe streets. Uh, there's pressure to do, grow jobs and create a strong economy. There is um, ability to, as Art said at the beginning, you know, at basic services and you know, cleaning up um, snow removal. There's a lot of pressure on your plates. Why would fair housing come up as a priority? Why would breaking concentrations of poverty come up as a priority? How do you mainstream these issues in the dialogue of a day-to-day -day agenda setting of a local or regional, you know, I guess, playbook? And I know that when, you know, Brookings has certainly worked with a lot of mayors in cities and regions around the country around economic opportunities, and the issues that you talk about don't rise up um, as central. They're there, but they're not central. How do you make them central? Uh, I, I would say, um, yeah. so think about it at the local level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what would you say me, to your other mayors? Let me take a crack at that. Uh, I would say uh, that it's about neighborhoods. Uh, you know, at the federal level, I've noticed we don't talk in, you know, you always hear the word communities, like, you know, like the folks on the staff are always writing the word communities in. When I was at the local level, you would hear about neighborhoods, neighborhood associations, folks that represent neighborhoods. And for local officials, it's thinking about the concerns of the people in your council district or your county commissioner dis precinct or district, the people that you represent, and making sure that there's opportunity throughout neighborhoods in the city. Uh, and so you know, I think that you're right. I mean, I can tell you when I was back in San Antonio, it's not like I gave it no thought, mm -hmm. but um, it almost seems like we don't, at the local level, you don't, you think that somebody else is kind of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so getting uh, the vernacular right, but more importantly than that, connecting with folks at the local level in terms of creating prosperity for all of these neighborhoods that you represent and what that would mean to folks that you're going and visiting with at their community center, their rec center, you know, the people that email you in about concerns in their neighborhood, infrastructure, transportation, housing. Bringing it down to that level, I think, is, is important to get folks to care. Um, you know, I would say at the national level, all of this talk about income, income inequality, which I think is very justified, and, and opportunity. I mean, this this is very much it. But at the local level, you know, I don't, you know, people, yeah, they're following the national level about income, the discussion about income inequality, but that's not the way that I think folks see it or feel it. It's really what's happening in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can bring it down to that level, I think that we'll get more interest and take up in these local from these local officials. Yeah, you know, I would build on that by saying that um, I think this country, and if I, my sense of the American people in general and my specific experience as a mayor is that I think people are kind of, I think we're tired of being stuck in the same boxes we've been in. This impending feeling that some of the problems that have been with us for 50, 60, longer, number of years are so intractable. I think people want to break out. And the problem is that not the high-level concept, but to, to, to Julian's point, when you start getting into the practical elements of how you break out of the box and actually start to solve these problems, it becomes a great challenge. One of the things that my favorite things about uh, Julian was, was as, as a mayor, he was able to 
convince his community to invest in pre-K. Uh, he, he did one of, one of the most sweeping uh, efforts towards pre-K education I think any mayor's done. That's a big deal. Um, but it takes a lot of a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat to get those conversations going. In my case, I was trying to use infrastructure to solve some of these problems, and a lot of what I heard back was, oh, you want to put this streetcar to nowhere or, <laughs> or what have you. And, 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 you know, the thing that I would remind people is that in 1971, I was born in a neighborhood that was, that was basically surrounded by freeways. And my neighborhood, 10 years before, had multiple ways in and out. By the time I came along, there was only one way in and out. And the horizon was something I couldn't see because of the physical barriers of our highways. So uh, the infrastructure I was trying to build was infrastructure that had it been there when I was growing up, maybe there would have been a pharmacy in my neighborhood. Maybe there would have been a doctor's office in my neighborhood. Maybe there would have been a grocery store in my neighborhood, but I didn't have those things. And so I think we have to, in order for us to solve some of these ultimate questions we have about opportunity, we have to do things differently. And I think it's the doing part that gets challenging at the local level. And so I think the powerful thing about the president's focus on this is that when the federal government says, what are your ideas to solve this problem in your backyard? there's a sense that the federal government's actually going to do something to help. And when we do choice neighborhoods or when we do the ladder step program or ladders of opportunity work, communities start to get a sense that they can actually solve these problems. And seeing it happen in community after community gives you a lot of hope for the future. Well, I think you just witnessed why having two mayors lead federal agencies is a very powerful, grounded experience. Um, we're going to open this up for questions in just a moment, including those who are watching on um, the webcast. Um, so get your questions ready. <coughs> and if you are interested in asking a question, you can also answer it through the Twitter uh, using hashtag Pathways2. Um, but let me close with um, the real burning question, which is that goes back to the point that you made, Secretary Fox, about how these issues have endured. At the end of the day, the reason why enforcement has been so hard or getting to this vision is so hard isn't just simply because of local housing policies or because of legislation. It is because of race, racial discrimination. And I think for folks who've been working on these issues for a long time, there's been just constantly community resistance to affordable housing in their neighborhoods, mixed income units in their neighborhoods, uh, multifamily units in their neighborhoods. And so while this all sounds great, is when you get down to the neighborhood level, sure. um, the, the, the community obstacles are pretty large. So um, I want to hear how you, what language you would use. Um, to appeal to a wider group of residents and leaders about why creating opportunity-rich neighborhoods, why embracing diversity is part of the pathway to prosperity. What's in it for them? Um, it's a great question. Uh, and you know, there was no easy answer to that. I sat, uh, I remember as councilman and as mayor, Every other week, basically, we would have zoning cases come up, a zoning agenda. And uh, you know, as in any big city, uh, it was guaranteed that just about every time we did that, there were, you had a, a case of nimbyism somewhere. Um, but the argument that I used to make was, um, number one, uh, trying to humanize people because often folks are demonized or characterized in, in unflattering and negative ways, and point out the cases where people have actually had a chance to reality test. This was a point that was well made, um, I think, uh, in the HBO miniseries, Show Me a Hero, after the Yonkers case. That, and I forget the woman's name that was originally like really against 
the housing development and then got a chance to interact and meet with and eventually help a lot of the residents who moved in uh, to the affordable housing there in Yonkers. But, but pull out the, 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 uh, the instances, scenarios where people have gotten to reality test and have seen that that multi, the people, the people, not just the units, the people that live in those multifamily units um, were just like everybody else. And more than that, there wasn't the, the nightmare of problems that people thought were going to happen. Pull out the concrete cases to relate to folks what has happened in the past. Um, and then secondly, you know, and this is just, just as important, I think, when these decisions are actually made, voted on as a practical matter, making the argument to colleagues who are voting on it that really it's everyone's responsibility throughout the community to ensure that they're doing their part. Um, that's not always an easy argument or one that wins the day, but you know, there's so many of these that come up that it might be in my district today and your district tomorrow, and people have to work together to ensure that, that communities throughout an area shoulder what they think of, even if they think of it in negative terms, mm -hmm. as a burden. And often they do think of it in negative terms because it creates this controversy. Um, so I, I've just found that, that trying to humanize the situation is probably the best approach, and then making sure that folks understand that everybody has a responsibility. You know, I, w I would say that um, uh, the environmental movement, I think, has given us a good frame for dealing with these issues um, in the sense that, of course, there are moral reasons to uh, to think differently about the future than we've probably thought in the past on some of uh, issues of race and poverty and so forth. Um, but there are also very clear economic reasons. Um, poverty is actually pretty expensive, both for the country and for the poor. Um, and uh, I think we're on the cusp of a, a new round of complications of poverty as we start to see the suburbanization of poverty, where people are moving because their value, property values and the cost of owning or renting something in the, in the center city is now so much more. People are moving out to the suburbs to work, but they end up becoming more isolated because the transportation systems there are not as robust and they don't have cars, and it gets to be much more complicated. And, um, so I think if we took a rational look at this, we would say that we need to really figure this out because ultimately America's prosperity is so much stronger when we have more people in the middle class and more people having a real shot to get into the middle class. And as long as uh, folks are trapped physically, psychologically, economically, uh, we're going to have problems in this country and it's going to be, be more expensive. The only other thing I would say is that, um, is that I also think that in, in conversations like this, when we start getting into topics about race or, or income, um, I think they, they are too philosophical. Um, in, in other words, uh, it, get, it gets down to the practical. Uh, what are we willing to invest to solve these problems? You know, whether it's education, whether it's housing, whether it's transportation, uh, what are we really willing to do? And that's why I think empowering local officials who are best positioned, in my view, to grapple directly with some of the nuts and bolts of these issues and investing in them the resources and the accountability to make sure they deliver, I think that's really um, where some of these issues get resolved from a governmental standpoint. Okay, it is your turn. Um, any questions from the audience or from the webcast? Um, I see a hand from Sandra Bear. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself and your affiliation too? Thanks, Amy. Sandra Bear with Personal Cities. Um, my question is really exactly what you've just been talking about, dealing with the city of Atlanta and how important this race, race issue is. Uh, what, are, what are your ideas about, I mean, the, the USDOT grant has mobilized this city and 77 others around the U.S., I think, so that's really exciting. But, but what, in your ideas, would be the very best next step 
to sort of gaining access to transportation, to get to jobs and education, to get the middle class more solid in a city. Um, I, I mean, I think there's so much that's, uh, it's like everybody's responsibility and no one's responsibility. <laughs> so where is the, what's the nugget that you could tell us that, I mean, I'm sure it's not once it's size fits all, but what, what could you tell us to sort of get these cities mobilized to keep this momentum going? Thank you. Well, I, you know, I would say that having um, enlightened leaders who, are, who care about this issue and are willing to lock arms with each other at the local level, be it a mayor, county executive, MPO representative, and having them think comprehensively about what each part of this is. You know, from my vantage point, um, um, I frankly think we need to look at some of our highway facilities in this country and rethink them because they were literally, in some cases, designed to do exactly what they're doing, which is to pose a physical barrier to economic opportunity. And, um, you know, if somebody in 1956 can determine the future of somebody in 2016 that way, <laughs> we've got a problem. Um, I would also say that uh, the integration of transportation and land use, which gets into the housing aspects, is so critical. So, uh, for example, when I was sitting in my zoning meetings, uh, <laughs> there'd be a lot of pressure to allow more density in the area of my city that was fast growing and very positive economic growth areas. There was very little push for that density in the other three quarters of the city. And the problem with that is, is that that is a recipe for sprawl. Because eventually, rather than going to those three quarter areas, the development's gonna go into the exurbs. And um, so I think having a robust strategy for how those underserved areas play into the overall economy is very important. And being very clear that the community's lifeblood depends on having those areas as strong as they can be. I think that conversation just can't happen enough, in my view. Other questions? Right over here. And then here, yes, go ahead. I'm gonna ask you both to, uh, go ahead and stand up. I'll have you both re uh, pose your questions and we'll answer both of them. Is it a battle? If we <laughs> <laughs> the lip sync battle, I know. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, um, Solomon Green from the Urban Institute. Um, and my question uh, is primarily directed at Secretary Castro and this question about how do you centralize not just an equity agenda at, at the local level and make it part of a mainstream strategy, uh, but specifically with regard to AFFH. Um, one of the ways you do that is by having constituents and advocates pushing for it and making sure that this is has sort of broad support and vocal uh, supporters. Um, one of the challenges, I think, with the AFFH rule is that uh, the housing field itself is somewhat divided and sees in it both a threat to place-based initiatives and a threat to mobility strategies. It's like the blind man and the elephant. You can mm -hmm. find the problem. Uh, but it, it, what do you say to reassure and help unite the housing field around AFFH as an opportunity promotion, promoting strategy? On that. Let me ask, oh, let him sure, ask sure. his question, and we'll just get to both. Uh, Calvin Gladney, Mosaic Urban Partners. Um, many of the trends in cities today, whether it's housing, smaller units, multifamily, TOD, or transportation, new types of infrastructure, bike lanes, streetcar, and the like, um, face lots of opposition from lower income and long-term stakeholders in those cities. What would you say to them for them to better understand the benefits they, they get from those new uh, approaches? Yeah, well, thank you all both for the questions. Uh, and, and just taking the first one mostly, and I'll touch a little bit on the second. I'm sure Secretary Fox will want to answer a lot on that. Um, with regard to AFFH, uh, number one, I think your question underscores the importance of the outreach that Gustavo and his team are going to be doing uh, really over the next several years uh, to ensure that, that local communities are engaged and that, that there's a new level of seriousness with which they take the assessment of fair housing. 
more than the analysis of impediments that's been in place, uh, and so, so that it's, it's more revealing, more substantive, more proactive, and ultimately uh, will do more to help desegregate community. That's number one. Secondly, though, I think that we have to continue to emphasize to folks that we want to do both things. You know, we want to invest in older, challenged, distressed neighborhoods, and we, want, we, we also want to create mobility for folks. Because every time you have, and Minneapolis is a perfect example of a city where they're, you know, torn over this question. Um, every time you start a conversation about mobility, people say, right, well, what about the people that don't want to move? I don't want to move. And, you know, I've been waiting for a sidewalk or I've been waiting for uh, better housing in my neighborhood forever, like for 40 years. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're forgetting about that. That's why I said in our traditional investing in our programs, we want to do a lot to lift up distressed neighborhoods. But at the same time, um, AFFH can be a powerful tool to enhance mobility and to make very plain in that data, reveal very well how underinvested in those older distressed neighbor neighborhoods have been whether it's in infrastructure and housing dollars or education dollars and so forth. So I think that, that if, if communities are engaged and if they're uh, well-informed and they take it seriously, that, you know, that they have what they need there and we want to have, we, we want to help them have the tools to put together powerful plans for the future that can balance these competing concerns. Uh, and then on, on the other question, you know, what, what, <laughs> What uh, Anthony was very kind, and he did say, was that he was actually able to get a streetcar through Charlotte, whereas I failed miserably <laughs> in San Antonio. Like two weeks after I left, they, they, the new mayor and the county judge did away with the streetcar plan that we had. Uh, but you're right. Uh, I think uh, I'll just take a very quick crack at that. Number one, there's opposition to rail. I mean, any time, anywhere, any place that it is proposed, just about. Uh, and I think it's true, and you're the one that told me, I mean, that you have to get the first part of it done at least. But in the context of creating opportunity, um, one of the lessons that I did learn out of the San Antonio experience was, in, in, which you alluded to, like you do have to make it relevant to people's lives. Because one of the critiques that comes up is, like, why am I, I'm not, I'm not going to ride this. You know, this, this doesn't, and what if it doesn't go near me, and I'm not going to take this, this, uh, you know, route. Um, I think that's a challenge with regard to transportation investments and other types of investments as well. Uh, and, and that's why I do think, though, at the local level, sometimes even more than at the national level these days, where I think it's become harder and harder to summon a common national identity. Um, but at the local level, where it is more nonpartisan, and you can have the wind at your back in terms of a sense of community identity uh, to, to, to try and connect the dots for folks. That number one, the intention is for the investment to be made throughout the community one day. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, that, uh, that there is an overall economic benefit that the community gets. And so there is a connection that people have in that sense. Uh, those types of arguments that, that really strike at a common interest. I, I might just two seconds on this. I, I think there's a lot of history there, and there are people who remember the last time the state or the local government said they were going to do an infrastructure project, what happened to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be very sensitive to that. And I think it was Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan who said that uh, transportation is far too important to leave to civil engineers. <laughs> um, uh, and I think there's some truth to that, which is that as public input processes go forward and as community input is, is, is tested in the early stages of these projects, I think we have to be very attuned to the fact that infrastructure hasn't always been seen as a positive in every community. And as we're trying to put infrastructure in place that can actually help deal with some of the intractable problems in communities, we have to expect a little resistance and a lot of conversation. Great, I think we have time for just two more questions and we're gonna ask them both at the same time as we did last time so you can uh, field them both at the same time. I'm gonna allow this woman who's been patient and then one question from um, the Twitter, webcast in the Twitter. Oh no, the, 
Sorry. Thank you very much. My name is Mina Marifat. I'm an urban designer, and uh, I also am a historian, and I teach. And thank you, um, Mr. Fox, for addressing history. I think it's really important to remember that in the 1950s, when several policies at the national level coincided, not intentionally, but perhaps unintentionally, it was the Highway Act, it was the Housing Act, it was the Urban Renewal Act, and it was the Desegregation Act. All of them coincided, and together, uh, a perfect storm was created, and our cities were changed forever. And suburbanization, as we know it today, emerged. And we're still trying to recover from those without realizing that those policies, well-intentioned as they were, were the cause of what happened. In today's age, with all of the complexities and all of the issues with climate and all of the social uh, injustices of inequality that we have, can we actually start thinking again about policies? And they may be outside the realm of uh, housing and transportation. They may be in the realm of education. But shouldn't we be thinking of national policies that once again may try to ameliorate some of the issues that we face on a daily bas basis in cities? Great. And, <coughs> and this question comes from the Intersector Project. How can government work with private and nonprofit sectors to create pathways to opportunity at the local and national level? Well, um, I think what you're hearing from me on, on this question is um, I think we have enough experience at the federal level of screwing this up <laughs> uh, to know that the local communities and the regions should really have more autonomy, if you will, to vision for themselves and with the support of the federal government address those visions with uh, not only resources but programmatic support. That's, that's my over, overarching view of this. I would say a corollary to that is I think the federal government is ill-equipped to deal adequately with these issues. Um, there's a lot of urban, suburban, rural food fights that happen in Washington. And what happens at the programmatic and policy level is you, get, you end up with things like a highway trust fund that puts 80% of every dollar into roads and 20 cents on every dollar into transit. When you know, a far more sensible way to do it would be to create the flexibility for state and local governments to put those dollars where they will most do the most good for, uh, for mobility. But that's, you know, that's a next stage kind of question. Um, on this, on the, on the issue that was raised, um, I think nonprofits in the private sector uh, actually play a fairly significant role in transportation decision making today. If you look at state boards of transportation, uh, who gets appointed to those, a lot of them end up being business people. If you look at uh, local communities and chambers of commerce and uh, local, local uh, uh, philanthropic agencies, um, their voices actually need to turn more to these issues because it is no longer just a question of how many cars can you get through a certain uh, lane at a given hour of the day, although that's really important. I think increasingly these quality of life issues are going to play a, 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 an increasing role, and I think those agencies need to begin thinking more holistically about some of these issues about how we live together, because that's, that's ultimately going to be what defines a good community going forward. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, it's clear um, in this time when when demand for whether it's transportation infrastructure or affordable housing uh, outstrips the investment that is being made, that we have to be creative, uh, and we have to engage the nonprofit world and uh, sector and the private sector. A good example of this is recently we did something called Connect Home, uh, which was uh, an effort with internet service providers and nonprofits to connect uh, public housing residents in 28 communities to the internet because the vast majority of them right now are not connected to the internet, and all of us know how important that internet connection at home is to actually getting ahead in life. 
Uh, and this is something that uh, basically $50,000 of, of federal government money plus staff time, but just $50,000 of allocated money is being spent on. The rest of this uh, is being invested in uh, almost completely by uh, these internet service providers like Google Fiber and Sprint and Comcast and a number of others. So uh, yes, we need to do more of that and be smart about it. And I do think the administration has been smart about that over the years. And then just to answer your question, um, I think you bring up a very good question and putting it in the historical context uh, of these things coming together in the 1950s, 60s, but, but then, you know, we get into the Johnson era, Johnson era, the Great Society, and that's where we got, you know, the, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, and, and which, if you think about it, should have been a temper on some of those trends that you're talking about. That's why we were so pleased to finally get AFFH done and if we do it well, uh, in conjunction with local communities, then we can see uh, a blossoming of opportunity in more neighborhoods out there and for more people out there of different backgrounds with different skin colors and different last names and you know, income levels and so forth. Uh, and so that's our way of, of trying to, to kind of right the ship, so to speak. Uh, I, I think that we can continue to make those gains. So I think we just saw a display of incredible interagency partnership, but also a partnership between the federal government and cities and metropolitan areas. Please join me in thanking Secretary Castro and Secretary Cox.